Hi, my name is Steve Murphy, and welcome to the Insider Exclusive. Today we have a very special show. It's called America's Finest Trial Lawyers and Southern California's Premier Law Firms. And we're featuring Dan Petrocelli of the law firm of O'Melveny and Myers. Stay tuned. The federal courts are using a federal set of guidelines. Mm -hmm. You literally go on a chart yes. and you look at what you were convicted for, how much money was involved, and it tells you what the sentence is. It's almost like a vending machine. We believe that that is the wrong way to sentence an individual. You have to look at a person's life. Right. You have to look at all the circumstances of, of, the, of the conviction, and you have to do what is just. And the sentencing guidelines don't do that. I'm frequently asked, you know, how I got involved as, yes. a, as a civil trial lawyer in such a big criminal case. Uh, I met Mr. Skilling, and the first thing I said to him, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Skilling, he said, call me Jeff. I said, well, you know, Jeff, um, I'm not a criminal attorney. Right. And he said, well, you know, Dan, I'm, I'm not, not a, a criminal. criminal. I am pleased to have with us today Dan Petricelli from O'Melveny and Myers. Welcome to the show. Nice to meet you, Steve. You have been involved with some of the biggest cases in recent years. And if our audience doesn't know what they are, what are they? Well, ten years ago, I was fortunate enough to represent the family of Fred Goldman uh, in their wrongful death action against O.J. Simpson. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as we all know, that case resulted in a finding uh, by the jury uh, a unanimous finding, 12 to 0, that Simpson was responsible uh, for killing Ron Goldman, Fred's son, and Nicole Brown Simpson, uh, the mother of Simpson's two children. Mm -hmm. uh, the jury returned a verdict in that case of $33.5 million, $25 million of which was for punitive damages. Really? That remains uh, one of the largest uh, punitive damage awards ever against a single individual. You were also involved in a recent case down in Houston. Last May, uh, we concluded uh, the trial of uh, Jeffrey Skilling, uh, my client, and uh, the client that um, an O'Melveny legal team, of which I was privileged to be a part, uh, represented, and uh, Ken Lay, who was represented by uh, Michael Ramsey and other lawyers, uh, in a case brought by the United States government um, in a uh, criminal matter uh, alleging that uh, Mr. Skilling and Mr. Lay had violated uh, securities laws. Mm -hmm. um, that case resulted in a, um, a verdict of guilt against Mr. Lay on all counts, a uh, verdict of guilt against Mr. Skilling on 19 counts, and an acquittal of Mr. Skilling on nine counts. Now that case um, uh, is currently on appeal. Yes. Uh, Ken Lay, of course, uh, tragically Absolutely. passed away mm -hmm. after the trial occurred uh, while he was awaiting sentencing. Right. That brings up an interesting point because ha him passing away before he was sentenced, the verdict was vacated, wasn't it? Not only was the verdict vacated, but the whole case was vacated. Ab initio, as they say in the law, which yeah. means from the very beginning, it's though it never happened. Yes. So he, um, he passed on uh, with his uh, record legally unblemished. It's almost like that was the best thing he could do after he got convicted. Well, um, uh, some barring, people... Barring a successful appeal. Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm sure he would have uh, preferred, preferred to have the uh, ability to withstand... Uh, uh, that ordeal and uh, see it through to the end, like Mr. Skilling. Now, Mr. Skilling, Steve, uh, was sentenced uh, a few months after yes. the verdict to 24 and a half years. Long time. One of the longest sentences ever meted out uh, against a, a, a white-collar defendant. Yes. And here's a man who uh, uh, emblazoned the, the magazines of the world's uh, you know, most prominent publications uh, mm -hmm. just a number of years ago and being heralded universally as a pioneer and a, um, and a real leader in business. Um, so it just shows you how the winds of fortune can change. Now, the good news uh, for Mr. Skilling and for all of us who, who represent him and believe in him um, is that his appeal is, is, um, is happening right now. Yes. And in fact, we are getting ready to file our, our uh, opening brief um, and then uh, sometime early next year, uh, we will be in New Orleans before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal arguing the case. What, what is the outlook? 
The outlook is quite good. Um, in fact, the Court of Appeal has already issued a preliminary opinion okay. that 14 of the 19 convictions suffer from serious legal frailties. So we are guardedly optimistic. Interestingly enough, there were some other Enron defendants who were convicted at the trial level, went to prison, and recently their sentences were overturned also, weren't there? Regarding the Nigerian barge incident, right? Well, Steve, it's actually um, more compelling than that. Every single Enron conviction has been, has overturned? been reversed on appeal. No kidding. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a testament to what happens when um, po political and public hysteria um, the get, mob get, in the, yeah. get in the way of the justice system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, there probably has never been a more poignant example of that than the Enron story. Um, uh, no, nobody had the, uh, the patience or the desire yes. to understand what was, frankly, a very complicated case. Yes. And uh, judgment was pronounced long before anybody sure. ever stood trial. I know you tried to get a change of venue, meaning try to get it out of Houston and have it tried some other place unsuccessfully, unfortunately, for your client. Um, Bernie Ebers, WorldCom, got an equally long sentence. Well, I think it was 25 years. Yesterday, a sentence was handed down on Joseph Nazio, who used to be the CEO of uh, Quest. He only got six years. Is the tide changing? The, the problem, Steve, is that the federal courts are using a federal set of guidelines, mm -hmm. which was really adopted in the 80s by the Reagan administration and Congress uh, right. uh, at the time uh, for the war against drugs. And um, it lists out what sentences ought to be in particular circumstances, and the idea was to take away the discretion of judges to determine in their own judgment what yes. a sentence ought to be. So the, the reason why these sentences are very high and at times may, may seem unduly low is it, 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 it uses the guidelines, and you, you literally go on a chart, yes. and you look at what you were convicted for, how much money was involved, and it tells you what the sentence is. It's almost like a vending machine, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, we, we, we believe that that is the wrong way to sentence an individual. You have to look at a person's life. Right. You have to look at all the circumstances of, of, the, of the conviction, and you have to do what is just. And the sentencing guidelines don't do that. Well, the inter you bring up two interesting points. You're talking about the mandatory sentencing guidelines, which after the Booker decision, was it, uh, was changed to the advisory uh, sentencing guidelines, but most judges are still following the mandatory guidelines, aren't they? Exactly. The Supreme Court declared these guidelines a after so much uh, dissatisfaction with right. them to be advisory, not mandatory, because they literally deprive judges of the of the power to be judges. I mean, anybody could could look up a chart and hand out a sentence based on what's on a on a piece of paper. Now the judges are supposed to use them purely a, in an advisory way. Yeah. However, uh, many judges still prefer to just look at the chart yes. and give out the sentence. And, and I think the perfect example of the injustice of that is Jeff Skilling. Here's a man um, who got a 24 and a half year sentence for a case that uh, would not have survived a civil trial. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that um, because of its Enron, because it was in Houston, sure. because of the animus and the prejudice, and for a host of other reasons, uh, this case was railroaded right through the criminal justice system, yes. all the way through sentencing. And we think at the end of the day, the Court of Appeal will see that and will see that whatever one's views about Enron, uh, that Mr. Skilling did not get a fair trial. There's another issue. There was a case down in Houston on Dinergy. Do you remember this case? Dinergy? Sure. There was a middle manager who was sentenced to, I think, 24 years also. His name is Jamie Olis, and he was sentenced uh, to 24 years. Yes for uh, his involvement in a single uh, transaction, yes. a one transaction, and here's a guy married with a brand new kid, yes. uh, working his way, you know, uh, through the company, um, like, like, frankly, all the people involved right. in Enron, good people, you know, kissed their wife and kids, went off to church or temple, uh, you know, played golf, uh, good schools, uh, solid citizens, and they find themselves, you know, in the vortex of, of frankly, what was a, a political controversy. Right. And so, um, Mr. Olis was a victim of that. He was convicted for 24 years. The good news is that the Court of Appeal reversed that sentence as unduly harsh. 
went back down, got resentenced for about six years, six years yes. which was still a long time. And, you know, in the federal system, yes. there is no parole. Right. So um, anybody convicted in the, and sentenced under the federal system or in the federal system has to serve minimum 85% of their time. Well, the interesting thing about his sentencing was the fact an issue came up is what is he responsible for in terms of loss? I think at the initial trial level, they said that he was responsible for $100 million worth of loss. Did that play into the skilling sentencing too? Well, you are hitting on a very, very uh, significant legal issue and the details of which we won't have time to, to get into, but just okay. at the highest level of generality, these sentencing guidelines have these charts, as I was explaining, which indicate that if you commit a crime that results in a loss of a certain amount of money, then you get certain number of points against yeah. you for that, and that then dictates a particular sentence. Right. However, what Congress had in mind is the money that you literally stole or the grams of cocaine that, mm -hmm. or pounds of marijuana that you were distributing. What the federal government is doing and what the federal judges are buying off on um, is using the same loss figures in in determining how much a stock falls yes. and how much market capitalization is lost. Right. And once you start using this chart in the context of large public corporations with billions if not trillions of dollars of lost market capitalization, it drives the sentences literally right off the charts. Yes. And some courts, some courts, especially the courts uh, in the federal circuit back in New York, are finally putting their foot down and say, this makes no sense. But the, whenever a, uh, now that it's advisory um, sentencing guidelines, whenever a judge looks at, you know, what is the reality that we're really dealing with here? The prosecution will automatically appeal that sentence to the next level up, right? Yes, the so, prosecution can appeal the sentence. So why aren't federal judges, if they're lifetime appointees, being more courageous in, in exercising their discretion now that they have the capability, why aren't they doing it? Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has not gone far enough in denouncing these uh, guidelines. The judges know that if they issue a sentence that conforms to these guidelines, yes. that the courts of appeal will consider that su sentence presumptively valid. Mm -hmm. And judges are people they don't want to be reversed on appeal, sure. and the safe thing to do is issue the guideline sentence. Why don't they want to be reversed on appeal if it's something they believe in? Come on, there's got to be people of principle and character on the bench, right? Uh, well, uh, you would hope so, and by and large there are, and uh, I'm a very, very uh, big believer in our justice system, so don't get me wrong. The problem is, is that in high-profile cases, mm -hmm. in cases that touch political and public controversies, the justice system at times breaks down. You tend to get aberrational results in such cases, not in the ordinary case, mm -hmm. uh, where there's nobody in the courtroom and you're not asking me questions about it and uh, nobody knows the case is going on. But you take the O.J. Simpson case as an example. Take the criminal case. Uh, Simpson was stone guilty. Mm -hmm. That jury deliberated in three and a half hours, 12-0 acquittal, and he goes home to a hero's welcome. Yes. And uh, there are a number of cases like that. Mm -hmm. You tend to see these distorted results in high-profile cases. And why? Because you have a collision between the justice system and the media and the world of entertainment and even politics. And, and in that, in that uh, dynamic, oftentimes people fall down in doing their jobs uh, in the justice system, whether they be Lance Ito, yes. who presided over the O.J. Simpson uh, criminal case. And I might also add the Charles Keating case. And, and the Charles Keating case. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Judge Ito, um, sadly, uh, inviting celebrities into his chambers yes. and signing uh, autographs and uh, paying more attention to that single uh, unobtrusive camera yes. in, in the corner of that small courtroom which ended up dominating that trial and exploding that courtroom across a world stage. Let me ask you this. We talk about all of these forces that are, it's almost like the perfect storm, you know, in a high publicity case. Enron, the company, collapsed. 
Who is responsible for that collapse? Ultimately, the, uh, the board of directors and the uh, senior management is responsible. But that does not mean criminally responsible. And by the way, it might not even mean civilly responsible. People have to be guilty of a crime mm -hmm. uh, in order to go to jail. People have to have broken some civil law in order to have some judgment assessed against them. Just because a business fails does not mean that somebody has broken either a civil or a criminal law. In the case of Enron, because the company uh, collapsed in, in such sudden and dramatic fashion, um, it went from the seventh largest revenue producing company in the country to, out of to, to, to bankruptcy mm -hmm. in about two months. Mm -hmm. the, the forces which caused that bankruptcy uh, were never understood. The credit tightening. And the, the credit tightening, a punishing drain on liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, the company was driven largely by a trading operation uh, which requires credit and requires good faith. Uh, just imagine what would happen if you woke up one day and you read in the newspaper that the bank where your money was deposited was in financial trouble. Mm -hmm. You and everybody else Run would, the be, bank. would be going down to that bank lining up. And, of course, that's what happened in the Great Depression when, they, when there were all those runs on the bank. Sure. And, of course, uh, what, one of the cures for that now is we have federal uh, deposit insurance and you have the uh, Federal Reserve System. Yes. Well, public companies with similar banking business don't have the protection of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So um, Enron was in a, in, a, in a business that lent itself to that potential risk. And that was never quite understood. And, um, and when the company went down so quickly, it missed claims of fraud and all right. this other stuff, then of course the politicians uh, you know, got, got all ex sure. exercised. And because of the president's close relationship with President Bush's close relationship with Ken Lay, of course, the Democrats saw, saw an opportunity, an opportunity yeah. to really exploit that politically. And, um, and then the, the, the Republican administration distanced, distanced themselves from Bush. It was all politics at that point. Right. And, and really, the, 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 the story was written right then and there. Let me ask you this question. Obviously, there was some fraud taking place in Enron. There was no fraud at Enron. Steve. Andy Fastow? was not involved with any fraudulent activity? Andy Fastow was involved with fraudulent activity, but not uh, in the conduct of his work at Enron. In other yeah. words, uh, you have to understand, if you're working at a company, yes. and you're moonlighting, and you're ripping the company off, right. that's not fraud uh, by Enron. That's fraud by somebody in which Enron was the victim. And it turns out that the only real criminal activity was by uh, Andy Fastow in ripping off uh, Enron, Enron's senior management, Enron's shareholders, and defrauding that company. Michael, Something, by the way, right. that he absolutely admitted on cross-examination at our trial. Let me ask you this question. What about the prosecution's responsibility if they are aware that he is the guy that's responsible, like Michael Cooper, I think, too? What is the prosecutor's responsibility not to prosecute people like Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling? Why didn't that take, take hold? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, prosecutors, um, they may be well-intentioned, but they're human beings like the rest of us, mm -hmm. and they're motivated by political ambition, personal drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of the cases are routine. You get an opportunity to get a headline case. Yeah. They want and, their name in the paper. The and, uh, you know, those prosecutors, you know, rightly or wrongly, they're now all gone from yeah. the government. Uh, in other words, the the Enron saying, case was yeah. their swan song, and they're now yeah. in large Private law firms. Practice. So, I mean, yeah. uh, there are opportunities there, but and they, it may cloud their judgment. Yeah. Question. We, in the news recently, the OJ book has come out, and Fred Goldman, who you represented in the wrongful death suit, um, and he's represented, represented by somebody else right now regarding the book, right? Correct. And the Brown family are at odds about the release of that book. Fred, of course, saying, look, it, here's an asset that might generate revenue to reduce the indebtedness that O.J. Simpson owes our family and the Brown family. The Brown family saying, we don't want that book released. So you have two equal owners, basically, 
What do you see the legal issues here and how do you see it resolved? Well, I understand the points of view of both families, yes. and, and the good news is that during the trial, um, um, uh, the Brown family and the Goldman family uh, worked very closely together, and yes. we tried that case together uh, in order to get justice, which was to brand O.J. Simpson as a killer. Now, yeah. uh, with the issue um, of this book, uh, the difficulty that the Brown family has is, while on a personal level, you can understand why they just want this to be put to rest, yes. and they lost their daughter. Um, legally, it's very difficult in, in our system of laws with the First Amendment being, being so important and such paramount interest uh, to stop the publication of anything. Usually nothing can get stopped unless it threatens national security, which of course this doesn't. So uh, uh, if somebody's going to publish that book, um, uh, they have the legal right to publish that book. Now, I know Fox pulled the plug on it, yes. uh, or News Corp did, I guess, yeah. and um, that was not for legal reasons, uh, mainly that was because of uh, the public pressure and the public sentiment, and so they made a business decision. I laud them, I laud them for, them this, for that there decision. Was, there was some money paid to somebody. In terms of the money, though, and this is, what I think, what Fred Goldman's point of view is, if someone's going to be profiting yeah. um, off of this tragedy, um, that ought to be stopped. Uh, particularly if it's O.J. Simpson. He owes uh, probably in excess of $40 million. He hasn't paid a dime of it. And uh, Fred, as well as the Brown family, have the right to go track down that money. And it's like the Watergate story. You follow the money. Yes. Okay? And um, uh, legal process and legal means exist by which those funds, wherever they can be found, can be uh, seized and orders can be issued by courts to direct the payment of those monies yes. to the victim's families. Okay. The justice system in America is probably one of the best ones in the world. It is the best one in the world, bar none. There are aberrations and there are, let's say, misjudgments in the system. How do you view the OJ case and its outcome in terms of finally getting a resolution, not just financially, but let's say morally? I think the justice system showed that uh, at the end of the day, it worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this country, we have a dual system of justice. We have the criminal system, we have the civil system. Yes. It wasn't the system that broke down in the criminal case. It was the people in the system who broke down. Right. It, was, it was a judge who, who, who was not strong enough to control the case. It was prosecutors and defense lawyers and witnesses who were more concerned about that camera in the courtroom yes. than about giving true evidence in a court of law. And fortunately, we had a very strong very down-to-earth, tough judge in the civil case. He wanted none of what happened in the criminal case. Yeah. He ran a tight ship, Good. and then the system worked. Okay. And also, um, to Fred Goldman's credit, uh, we opposed the use of cameras in the courtroom in the uh, civil case, and the judge agreed with our position, and that helped to normalize the trial. What other kind of cases are you handling? Because these are the two big cases everybody's seen in the news, but what other cases do you handle? I do a lot of work in the entertainment industry, yes. uh, representing uh, talent, representing studios, representing musicians, uh, record companies. Are these primarily like contract yes. disputes? Yes. Contract transactional? Uh, no, I'm... I'm just straight uh, litigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a junkyard dog, okay? okay. Uh, you know, just set me loose on a case and, you know, and I'm happy. Um, I also represent uh, uh, companies in uh, all sorts of business disputes, in the energy business, in the internet business. Yes. Uh, really, um, it runs the gamut. Now, the interesting thing about the Skilling case is that was my first criminal case. Yes. Um, and my only criminal case, and maybe judging by the results, probably my last one, but right. uh, when I first uh, met uh, Jeff Skilling, right. Because I'm, um, I'm frequently asked, you know, how I got involved as, yes. a, as a civil trial lawyer in such a big criminal case. Uh, I met Mr. Skilling, and the first thing I said to him, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Skilling, he said, call me Jeff. I said, well, you know, Jeff, um, I'm not a criminal attorney. Right. And he said, well, you know, Dan, I'm, I'm not, not a, a criminal. criminal right. <laughs> and I looked in his eyes, yeah. and there was a connection there. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I felt very, very good about representing this man since day one. When you represent anybody whether it's Jeff Skelling, whether it's, you know, anybody, do you always sit down with him and say, tell me the truth? 
I want to believe what your side is. Do you say that? <laughs> I mean, you know, there are lawyers that don't do that, and there are lawyers that well, do. What I, kind of lawyer are you? You know, I think that in the criminal defense arena, mm -hmm. uh, there are times when lawyers don't want to ask their clients yeah. those questions. Yes. Uh, that was not the case whatsoever with Jeff Skilling. He yes. understood that this was really going to look like, behave like, and act like a civil securities case much more than like a criminal case and he was dead on the money on that it's mm -hmm. probably one of the reasons why he was interested in all in all melvinese uh, civil trial lawyers like myself yes. but in civil cases of course it's very different steve because all the cards are out on the table yeah um so um of course you get all the information and you get the truth from your client yeah. uh, you, you hope to and um, that's one of the beauties of the civil system. I've always advocated that the civil system um, represents a much more pure search for the truth Why is that? than the criminal system. Because what the criminal system is about is whether the government can um, uh, prove its case to such a high degree of certainty mm -hmm. that someone's going to take away your liberty and perhaps even your life. Okay? The defendant does not have to testify. So oftentimes, all the facts do not get uh, put out on the table. There is very little discovery, which is the process by which lawyers get all the evidence before the trial. There's a lot of surprises that happen in criminal cases. Yeah. The civil system is the opposite. The civil system is designed to get all the information, all the facts, bring it to the courtroom. Nobody can refuse to testify. Everybody's got to take the stand. And, uh, and then a judgment is rendered and the burden of proof is much, much more even. So um, uh, you tend to get to the truth. And yes. I think the O.J. Simpson uh, dual cases are a good example. You found out the truth in the civil case? We did. And How Simpson, the smartest decision that that man made in the criminal case was not to take that stand because he would not have been able to withstand the, uh, the, the cross-examination. Now, in the civil system, mm -hmm. Um, he didn't have that option. Yeah. We called him as a witness in our case, and we were the plaintiff, so we went first. And near the end of our case, after we laid out all of the physical evidence and all of the motive evidence, we then called him to the stand and right. confronted him with that evidence. And I cross-examined him for a couple of days. And um, had he said uh, to the judge, Your Honor, I decline to testify, he would have lost by default. So he had no choice but to testify, and of course, um, uh, he was not able to answer the questions. Sure. There well, was too much evidence that was stacked against him. Well, this is one of the reasons why I have you here today, and I appreciate you coming here. You're one of the finest trial lawyers in the United States. Well, Melvin and Myers is a great law firm, and by the way, the website is www.omm.com. That's where you can find out more information about you. Thank you very much for being on this show. Thanks so much. I'd love Steve. to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you for watching our shows. I've enjoyed bringing you some great guests. You can see more of them at www.insiderexclusive.com. We'll be back again. Thanks.